Welcome back to Saving Ophelia. What you're seeing being taken apart here used to be Hale, or the sea, a wooden ship built about a year or two after Ophelia. Unfortunately, the owners seem to have been unable to keep up with the maintenance required for a wooden boat of this size, and last summer Hale sank in the harbour while awaiting a haul out. She was actually moored pretty much exactly where Ophelia is right now when she sank, so let's hope that's not important of things to come. I'll get Ophelia moved as soon as possible though, just to be on the safe side. If the rumours are to be believed, the butcher's bill from that sinking, as well as the backlog of work, would have run into around 4 million euros, or around 4.5 million US dollars, so instead the owners decided to scrap her. I can't say that I blame them, that is a lot of money to pour into an almost 70 years old boat, but it's still a shame. Anyway, this 21st episode is about the issues I'm having with Ophelia's engine, a subject matter where my practical experience and non-theoretical knowledge is quite close to non-existent. So if you hear me spouting rubbish or see me doing something I shouldn't or should be doing differently, I'd very much appreciate a comment below telling me so. We're pretty close to real time with these videos, so your input may actually make a difference in how I go about these things. A couple of weeks ago, when we moved Ophelia to the haul out, before I knew that the haul out was cancelled, we had to get help moving her since the engine wouldn't start. I had found some help beforehand because I kinda expected this to be a problem. Getting the engine started has been Ophelia's Achilles heel ever since I bought her and put the cooling system back together. Oddly enough though, I actually had the engine started the evening before the move. The engine didn't start on the first couple of attempts, even though I could clearly hear the starter motor engaging. But after pouring a bit of juice into the battery from shore power, I managed to get Ophelia's oily, beating heart up and running. When the engine started though, I did notice that the charge in the battery, as indicated by the battery's voltage, dropped quite a bit more than I'd expect from just that one start, from just over 13 volts to around 11.8. As this was the first time I had the engine started after Felix's winter slumber, I let it run for half an hour or so, during which time it ran perfectly. I then shut it down and connected the battery to an external charger instead of the engine so that it would be ready for the day after. Even so, when I attempted to start the engine on the day of the move with a fully charged battery, I could once again hear the starter engaging but it seemed unable to turn the engine. Odd though, because I could fairly easily turn the engine by hand using a spanner. And once again, just a few attempts at starting the engine caused quite a drop in the battery's voltage. I couldn't let all of my exceptional helpers just stand around waiting while I messed around with this engine problem. After all, I did find help for towing precisely because I expected this issue, so we set about doing what you could see us do in episode 19 and left the engine issues alone. Now I know there's nothing wrong with the engine itself. As I said, it ran just fine when I actually managed to get it turned and started. So we have either a mechanical or an electrical issue in the attached systems, the star and the generator or alternator. I strongly suspect that there's an electrical issue somewhere. This might be as simple as a bad battery. The one I've been using is probably fairly old by now, so I'm going to put in a larger and newer battery that I have on hand and see if that one can manage to start the engine. However, I've also measured a drop in the voltage across the battery just by connecting the battery to the engine, something which should only happen when something is drawing power, so I suspect that something else is at play here than just a bad battery. I started out by checking the voltage across the battery before doing anything else, as a later comparison with this number could give me an idea as to how much energy had been drained from the battery. As you can see, the battery was charged to 12.69 volts, not exactly high, but not too low either. While I was at it, I decided to check if there was an electrical connection between the two terminal connectors, because there really shouldn't be. As long as everything is turned off, the connection would go through the electrical system of the engine, including a couple of relays, or at least there should be a fairly massive resistance in any connection going that way. 
There clearly was a connection though, and the meter showed no connection when the probes weren't touching anything, so it was unlikely to be an equipment issue. I checked the result by touching the probes to the same terminal connector, and as expected it showed no resistance, so I redid the original measurement a few times and came up with a resistance of a whopping 1 ohm. Now, that result isn't very reliable. 1 ohm is unlikely to be the actual resistance, but it's quite clear that there is a connection where there, as far as I know, shouldn't be one. What you clearly can't see me doing here is checking the connectors on the back of the alternator. The electrical diagram of the engine says that there should be three of them, a positive, negative and a signal wire. I'm not entirely sure what the signal wire is for, but possibly to disconnect the alternator until the engine is actually running, so as to not add additional force for the starter motor to overcome. One potential issue with the engine not starting could be this system not working, so I disconnected the red wire, the live one, since I didn't need the alternator to make any power. These old diesel engines run without electricity once they're started, and as long as Ophelia is tied up, I could just charge the battery from shore power. This should prevent the alternator from generating too much drag for the starter to overcome. The connection I measured through the engine could be due to some relay not closing without power, so I checked the battery voltage once more and hooked the battery up to the engine. I immediately measured a voltage drop across the battery, so the connection clearly hadn't been closed. But as I now had the battery connected, I tried to start the engine. You can clearly hear the starter motor engaging, but being unable to turn the engine over. I checked the voltage drop once more, brilliantly done out of frame, but nothing had changed there, so something was allowing power to flow from the battery and bypassing the starter motor on its way. I remembered that the manual says that I really should let the engine warm up for around 10 seconds before attempting to start it, so I decided to do that and try again. Once more though, you could hear the starter motor engaging, but that was the end of it. So I disconnected the battery and started hunting for the likely short. A short circuit could cause this issue by acting as a voltage divider, splitting the voltage and thus the power according to the relative resistances through the two paths, the intended one through the starter motor and the unintended one through the short. Splitting the power in this way, with one of the paths having almost no resistance, would mean that at best around half the power would pass through the starter motor, but more likely it would just be a trickle. Seemingly though, just enough to make the starter motor engage. The worst case though would be a short through the hull, as that would be very hard to find and put an end to, but fortunately that doesn't seem to be the case. However, measuring from the terminal connectors directly to the engine shows a quite clear connection. This in itself isn't a problem. The engine block is often a part of the electrical circuit. However, if there's a connection from both the connectors to the engine block, then there's a problem. Which of course turned out to be the case. Just to be absolutely certain that this was an electrical issue rather than a mechanical one, I hand cranked the engine, but besides my clumsiness this was entirely unproblematic. Everything turns as it's supposed to, with the engine springing back when it's allowed to due to the compressed air in the cylinders. I reconnected the battery and tried starting again, just in case something that had been stuck now had come loose or that the engine was now in a more favorable position for starting, but no dice this time either. I mentioned that I had disconnected the live wire on the back of the alternator, but I had also disconnected the signal one. The neutral one, however, was bolted in place and disconnecting the live wire should be enough to break the circuit anyway, so I had left that one in place. The one wire that was still connected shouldn't let any power flow, where should it go to? 
but nonetheless, the connector leading that wire into the alternator turned out to be quite hot to the touch. This was a bit of a conundrum, so while I furrowed my brow and scratched the back of my head, I decided to fix another issue I had noticed while poking around. The swamp under the engine had collected quite a bit of water while I was away for a couple of weeks. It was still far from overflowing, but I might as well empty it out before it got to that. I moved the submersible pump from the remains of the saloon, where it stood guard over the now plucked broken through hole, to the swamp and let it do its thing. The pump didn't take long, but in the meantime I discovered the key to the security disconnects for the electrical system. It apparently found its way onto the engine mount a long time ago, at least I'd never seen it before, so I hugged the engine and stretched my already long arms to the max just to be able to snatch up the key. This didn't resolve the electrical issues with the engine of course, but it was still a nice find. Still stumped, I decided to pack up for the day and call my brother, the engineer, for some advice. We talked a bit back and forth and I described the power draw I was seeing and he agreed that something was off, but he wasn't entirely sure what. When all the switches are off, the power draw should be somewhere between very low and none, as there should be no path for the current except for possibly through a few relays but I still saw some sparking when I connected the battery terminals, so something was definitely drawing more than a little bit of power. Seeing that I've disconnected and physically removed all of Ophelia's electrical systems, the only source of this parasitic draw is either a short somewhere or something on the engine itself. One possibility that we discussed was a broken diode. To avoid power flowing into the alternator from the batteries, an electric valve called a diode is inserted in the circuit, but when these fail they often don't sever the connection but instead leave it open for the current to flow in both directions. That could explain the open connection I was seeing between the two terminal connectors. If the diode was working as intended I might see a connection when measuring one way, but then I would not see one when measuring the other way. In order to ascertain whether or not the alternator was indeed the source of the short, my brother and I decided to remove it entirely from the engine circuit. This was slightly fiddly, as is a lot of boat work, because of the lack of accessibility, but for once I managed to get it done without drawing any blood. Having this mini socket wrench was a bit of a lifesaver in this situation. It might be relatively limited as to what size nuts and bolts it can take, but getting a full sized wrench of any kind in place behind the alternator would have been quite a logistical nightmare. With the alternator removed from consideration, I repeated the measurement for the short circuit. Lo and behold, with the alternator gone, so was the short. Encouraged by the newfound lack of short circuits, once that I could measure at least, I hooked the battery up to the engine once more. 
Please note the distinct absence of any sparks when I connect the negative lead. I tend to leave the ladder for the companionway in place when I'm trying to start the engine after having messed around with it, just as a precautionary measure in case something goes very wrong. While Ophelia may be relatively fireproof with all her internals gone, I'm not. Remembering the need to preheat the engine this time, I wait the required 10 seconds after turning on the heater before I throw the ignition switch and then absolutely nothing happens. Once again, I hand crank the engine a bit before trying again, but still nothing. After conferring with the engineer once more, I decide to bypass the entire preheating system, meaning it gets no power whatsoever. Instead, I go directly to turning the engine and letting the heat of compression ignite the fuel, starting the engine. This time, after a bit more turning than usual, success. As usual, Ophelia's heart is running nicely, so I decide to let the engine run for a bit and thus move over to enable the cooling. Shortly after though, I notice that the alternator is generating quite a few sparks and a bad smell of hot metal, so I make a quick decision to shut the engine down once more. It seems that the problem with starting Ophelia's engine was down to a two-fold compounding issue. One was the short circuit through the alternator, which seems to be broken and either has a dead diode or an internal short, or both. The other was that with the heating enabled on a less than maxed out battery, there just wasn't enough power to turn the engine over. The heating coils start out by drawing quite a bit of power, but as they get hot, their resistance increases and their power draw drops. So with a fully charged battery, the engine can then start. However, the power bypassing the heating coils and the starter through the short meant that the coils didn't get hot enough for the power draw to drop leaving too little juice for the starter to actually turn the engine. Running the engine for any duration of time with a hot and sparking alternator is probably less than ideal, so I've decided to remove the alternator for now. This leaves a bit of an issue though, because while I don't really need the power the alternator produces when it's working as intended, it also serves as a belt tensioner, making sure that the cooling pump is being driven by the engine. While I can run the engine for a while without cooling, I can't run it for long enough under any kind of power to actually get anywhere. So I'll need to either fix the generator, replace it, or find another way to tension the belt. I also have to find a way to disengage the engine heating in the same instant as I engage the starter motor. Otherwise, I'm way too dependent on having a fully charged battery in case I need to shut down and restart the engine on the way but I think that a simple relay and some rewiring should be able to fix this part of the issue. I'm not entirely certain what I will be doing for the next episode, but for now it seems quite likely that I'll have to take a closer look at that alternator, or replacement, and the wiring involved in the starting process. Please remember to leave a like and do make sure that you're subscribed to the channel. There has been a few instances of people being unsubscribed by the forces that be or just not getting any notifications. Also, if you feel like supporting this project beyond watching these videos, you can do so by leaving a super thanks below, signing up as a member of the channel or by joining my Patreon. The link should be on screen now. Either way, I hope that you'll tag along again next week. So. Until then.